Hello, everyone. This is Lauren Steiner, and welcome to tonight's edition of the Robust Opposition. I'm really excited to have with me tonight uh, four guests, and they are um, starting at the bottom. I don't know if it's the bottom of your screen, but it's the bottom of my screen. Judith Whitmer, who is the newly elected state chair of the Nevada Democratic Party. How are you, Judith? I'm good. And uh, to above her to um, my left is uh, Lawrence Taylor, who is the co-founder and president of People for Reform of the Democratic Party. How are you tonight, Larry? Thrilled to be here, thank you. And to his uh, right, or right under me, is Selena Vickers, who is the West Virginia chair of the uh, PDRP. And uh, uh, next to me is Sonia Bykovsky, who is the Massachusetts chair of the PDRP. And we're going to learn all about the PDRP and what they're all about. But basically, our show tonight is called Taking Over the Democratic Party. And this is one of several shows that I've done on this topic. So I want to start uh, by asking my guests, what brought, what made you want to get involved in politics? And uh, when did you decide that being involved in your state party was the way to go? And let's start with you, Judith. Um, well, I first got involved in 2008 working on the Obama campaign. Uh, I was really inspired by his message of hope and change and yes, we can. As a single parent, that really resonated with me having to make decisions like, do I pay the electric bill? Do I buy groceries? What am I gonna do if my kid gets sick and I don't have health care, health insurance? So after that election, um, I was extremely disappointed watching how things played out from there because that's when I really started to pay attention to what really happens as far as backroom deals, why we couldn't get certain things done. I started doing a lot of research, started paying more attention. And that's when I really started to take more of an activist role after seeing the failures just from day one, starting with you know, trying to get to universal health care, then trying to get to a public option, and we couldn't even get there um, because of all the backroom deals. So that's when I decided to really you know, start to become involved. And what was the first thing you did to get involved? Well, I, I worked more on campaigns for candidates that I thought aligned with my values and principles. Um, so that was ongoing. I still had younger kids, so I couldn't take as active a role as I wanted to, but I still did what I could um, to find roles for myself to start being politically involved. Um, and that was, that was in Florida and Maryland. When I moved here to Vegas, I pretty much hit the ground running because by then I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Okay, we're gonna talk more about what you actually did do, but next we're going to go to uh, Selena. Lena Vickers, tell us how you got involved in uh, politics and specifically uh, state party politics. Yeah, well, let me just say I hate politics. Uh, I'm one of those people that feel like it's a, a necessity um, to be involved. Um, I, you know, pretty much always remember voting. I always remember being my sort of bottom line issue is trying to get money out of politics, but it seems like, like nobody really cared about that. And I just sort of like muddled along and I would kind of like work on a bill or two or something like that. But I, I never like really got into um, politics until Bernie Sanders ran in, 20, in 2015. I didn't know who, who he was. And um, I learned that he was running for uh, president without taking any PAC money. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, this, this man has to be president. Like this could fundamentally change the United States, change the world. And so I knew that there was something about delegates to win the primary. I didn't really understand it. So I started digging around and finding the right you know, delegate selection plan and talking to people who had been to conventions. And anyway, I just started like piecing together the puzzles of what we needed to do in West Virginia to elect um, Bernie Sanders uh, president, you know, doing what we could. And uh, we succeeded. We won every single county in West Virginia. And, uh, but yet he lost the, he lost West Virginia at the convention because of superdelegates. And then I sort of was like, wow, this is really messed up. And so I kind of set on a path of learning the rules, learning how to change the rules and learning how to 
um, I learned that there is actually some good rules that that are not enforced and trying to get those enforced. So it was not the path I ever thought, saw myself on. I just sort of um, fumbled around and got here because of a sense of uh, justice. Great. And now you, Sonia. Um, so but getting involved in politics was never a question for me. I was, I was brought into a very political family where when I would visit my grandparents, they would show up with lists of uh, companies they were boycotting and explanations why, and they would show up with videos of babies being born without limbs and explain to us, this is why we like boycott grapes because migrant workers are having, you know, their children born this way. And, you know, when you went to buy even a gift from your grandparents, they would look at the label and see if it was made in America. And uh, so I, I, it was never an option. And I didn't know uh, a label for my grandparents. I just knew they were caring people who thought the government should help people, all people equally. I later learned the word socialist and learned that my grandfather was repeatedly thrown in jail for standing on soapboxes in the 1930s and talking about socialism. So he was charged with criminal anarchy repeatedly. Um, so yeah, not really an option. My parents were Democrats, uh, you know, so I think like most people, I just was brought up a Democrat. Um, when um, there was some, what I'm gonna say, I got involved at my level more at a, uh, there was a local engagement that happened. There was this, I went to my little uh, local democratic committee because there was a, a race that uh, had come up for a registrar of deeds position. And there was one candidate who had been in the office for 12 years, who had a lot of experience. And there was this other candidate who was an electrician who happened to be the brother of the local state rep. And when I went to this little democratic committee meeting, they started talking about endorsing this guy. And I had the audacity to ask the question why we were going to, why we were talking about endorsing anybody, but why the guy with no experience. And it was all about nepotism. And um, when I asked to have a meeting to actually have people discuss that, uh, basically what happened is all the, all the town bullies showed up and they did not let me speak. I was literally called on by the chair and the state rep stood up, made this little speech and called for the meeting to be adjourned before I had a chance to speak. That incident made me actually leave the party. I went and became a green for a number of years and I came back when Bernie came on board. And uh, uh, you know, like other people have said, I kind of saw this person who was not like the others, who was not taking money, who was not controlled and who hadn't changed his position in 30 or 40 years. So. Um, I came back full, full tilt then, and that also ties into how I eventually became uh, interested in PDPR. Great. Well, leading into that, why don't you speak, Larry, and tell us about your political involvement? You actually <clears throat> were on the DNC, and tell us why you decided to start PDPR and what it is, what you hope to accomplish with it, and then we'll talk about uh, the miracle of Nevada, because <laughs> everybody loves a success story, and Judith was just totally awesome in what she was able to accomplish there. Well, uh, in in my opinion, you know, we have really um, uh, a choice of of how to fix the system. We either fix the Democratic Party or we start a third party. And of the two options, you know, neither one is easy. But uh, I believe that fixing the Democratic Party is an <laughs> easier shift than. Uh, starting a third party. The last time a third party was successful was 1854 when the Democratic Party took over from the Whigs. Um, so it isn't easy, but at least we have the vestiges of democracy inside the Democratic Party where we can actually, uh, you know, if we can find out the rules and how things work, we can, can make change. And the reason why I uh, founded PDPR is um, is because the Democratic Party is run as a priesthood and there really is no substantive interest in representation from the Democratic base. And so I started People for a Democratic Party Reform to educate people on their rights and how to assert those rights. And we also educate people on how to understand the rules so that ultimately in each state, they can uh, come up with a strategy and run candidates and, um, and start getting involved and, and uh, affecting the way things change. Okay, so here we have, um, we have three 
uh, well, two actually state chairs, before we, we go to Judith, we have two state chairs of PDPR. How many uh, chapters have you started? And um, what work have you begun to do? I know that you're gonna have a conference coming up, which we're gonna promote at the end of the show, but um, what have you actually accomplished in terms of um, informing people about these rules and getting them to change it? Um, last summer, we had a pre-convention in front of the Democratic National Convention. And really what that was was a model for everyone to understand how an actual convention would be run, as opposed to the pseudo convention, which the DNC um, uh, uh, put in front of us. What we did inside the PDPR was that we wrote a number of uh, bylaws changes that would go to the rules committee of the convention because they could actually be passed on the convention floor if they had gotten out of the rules uh, uh, committee and onto the floor itself. Um, what we proved was that the system was corrupt and, um, and all the reasons why, and they actually never even were, got considered by the committee itself, even though we had met all the deadlines and qualifications for submitting them. But they were changes like uh, instituting basic democratic uh, uh, changes to the, the way the DNC is run, like making the members of the standing committees elected instead of being appointed by the chair and making them geographically dispersed so that the whole country is represented on those committees as opposed to a small group of people on the East Coast. Another one that we tried to float was to make the <clears throat> superdelegate um, uh, um, associate members of the convention so they would not have a vote. So you actually got a representation of the convention of elected uh, delegates from the states where there was a equal representation roughly by all the delegates and it wasn't skewed by all of these extra votes that are thrown into the convention itself. So those are the things that we tried proposing to the rules committee last year. Yeah, now I did a show uh, last year, or maybe it was two years ago, the pandemic kind of throws my timeline off, but it was with in your state, uh, Judith, with Angie Morelli and um, gosh, I'm forgetting his name. He was an attorney. And he was very involved with trying to change those rules. Uh, do, you, do you remember what I'm talking about? There was um, it, was probably, it was probably Rob Kern. Yes, it was Rob. Rob, Rob Kern is now our, our state party attorney. Okay, so they were able to accomplish some things. Why don't you tell us? Because I, I was very, very impressed with what their plan was and how they went about achieving it. Why don't you tell us about the miracle of Nevada now? Well, I can't really speak to their plan. That was back in the 2016 convention. Although I had just moved to floor, uh, moved to Nevada from the Maryland area, um, I had uh, I had been elected as a state convention delegate and was running for national delegate. So I was involved and was there at the convention, but it wasn't within the party structure. wasn't part of um, you know certain groups that were organized around changing rules and bylaws because I had literally just moved there and, and immediately volunteered on the Bernie campaign and sort of focused on that um, and then worked my way up through the ranks um, to get to the state convention delegate. But it wasn't really part of any group or organization at that point. Uh, so I can't really speak to what was going on there, but to say that I was at the 2016 convention saw a lot of things that to me looked like they weren't right. I mean, just to an average observer, you would say, okay, that doesn't seem right. It sure as hell doesn't seem right that all of a sudden there's this long break and then uh, you know, a group of state troopers file out in front of the stage and we're all there quietly waiting for the meeting to resume. There's nothing going on. And then all of a sudden, you know, the gavel bangs and bam, you're done and they're escorting you out of the convention. To me, that just didn't seem right. Um, but I also thought at the time that progressives lost a lot of momentum after that, like there were some startups, but never any, any momentum built after that convention. It seemed like there was a lot of lost opportunity. So that's when I decided to start getting involved in party politics because I'd only been involved in helping on campaigns, not really in party politics. So that's when I started to build, you know, that movement from out of that and not seeing a lot of things happen in 2016, then I formed my formed a left caucus organization specifically within the party as a chartered democratic club to start moving the party to the left. 
And that's what we use to build our base from. Well, I want to stop you right there because Larry has some footage from that uh, uh, 2016 shit mm -hmm. show, which I can say, because this is not uh, broadcast television, but we were all watching that. And we actually had, I was running LA for Bernie at the time. And we actually had some of our LA for Bernie volunteers drive to Las Vegas to help with that. I'm thinking specifically mm -hmm. of Yolanda Varela Gonzalez and she and Nina uh, were trying to contain everything that was going on. So, yeah, this is where um, John Ralston, the reporter for, I forget the name of his publication, but he was the one saying that Bernie people were throwing chairs. Yeah. And that was proven to be not true. No. Oh, no. She's fucking crying before we even said me. She's meeting got a little rowdy a couple of times, but nothing that I would consider violent or out of the ordinary for any convention that I've attended. It, a lot of that had to do with the misunderstanding of rules and bylaws. Um, and, and Larry's told the story before that seeing that video clip inspired him to form PDPR. Um, so I'm grateful for that. At least, you know, that was one of the good things that came out of that. But um, you know, it, it's been sort of overplayed that there was all this contention and it was just horrible. But as somebody that was there in the middle of it, there were no chairs thrown, absolutely no violence whatsoever. There were some heated tempers, some exchange of words on both sides. Um, and, and really all of it boils down to not understanding rules and bylaws. Right. And I think big reasons that PDPR is so important. So um, why don't you talk about, because I know you've talked about this on other shows, but you haven't talked about this on my show, what you were just able to accomplish and how you did it, how you were able to take over the party. And we all know what happened afterwards. They sort of absconded with the funds, but you were able to raise it all back in like no time. Um, tell us what you did and could it be a model for other people trying to do the same thing? Sure. Well, what I first did was start, like I said, got involved in party politics. Um, so I made sure that I was a member of both central committees, the Clark County Central Committee, which is the Vegas area, and the state central committee. Um, and then I ran for office for the Clark County Democratic Party for an executive board position and was elected to that and then reelected to that and then um, eventually became the chair of the Clark County Democratic Party. Um, so it does, I mean, it, it didn't happen overnight. This was, you know, grassroots organizing for a number of years, for a couple of years at least. And like I said, at the same time, I formed Left Caucus as a chartered Democratic caucus under Clark County Democratic Party to start moving the party left. And it actually says that in our mission statement. We didn't make it a secret. Um, we said that that was, that was why we established Left Caucus and that was what we were to do. Um, and we quickly built our membership. And then when the caucuses came along in, in February of 2020, we had already been working, of course, all of our members had already been working on the Bernie campaign. Um, so we were still re able to recruit a lot of people from that. And then through the caucuses and the delegates, um, what we did was we made sure we were in contact with every single delegate coming out of that caucus um, to keep them involved, to keep them from den exiting, to keep them, at the county convention and then through the state convention. Um, we, we managed to, to make sure that all of our delegates that we touched base with them, they knew what was going on. We had workshop sessions to make sure that they understood the process. Uh, and then when it came time for the state convention, we worked hard on the platform. We'd already had a battle on the county platform and we were able to get the most progressive county platform passed in, his, in, in Nevada history. So then we went to work on the state party platform. So it was all about policies and issues. And that's how we kept people activated, kept them involved, actively engaged to make those changes to that platform um, with the planks that we wanted in the platform. And then from there, we ran um, a slate of nine candidates for at-large positions on the executive board of the state party. And we won nine out, of, well, we ran 10, we won nine out of 10. So um, we did really well there. And that was because we were very, very organized. We knew the structure of our party. 
we knew what we needed to do to win those races and we applied the same principles and practices that we had done to elect Bernie by landslide in Nevada. So uh, that's how we were able to start gaining those successes and keep people involved was through left caucus and through our organizing efforts from the delegates and you know using the delegates from the Bernie caucus and our landslide victory here um, and, pr and pulling all of that passion and energy and having a place for them to put it. Um, so we started getting them onto the state central committee as well. So that by March, we had a majority of the state central committee and then we were able to elect our entire slate of officers. Um, and at that point, then I became the state party chair and then um, other, my other progressive, the rest of my progressive slate were also elected to office. Well, I understand the organizing piece because I watched that happen in California in 2017. Um, it was the first time I had learned that there was such a thing as an assembly district delegate and that one third of them were elected from the general public. And I had never, even though I'd been a mem member of the Democratic Party for 42 years, never gotten involved in voting for an assembly district delegate before. But um, I saw that people decided that's how they were going to get involved. And so they formed slates and they campaigned amongst the general public and the Bernie public, if you will. And they got elected and we got 600 um, assembly district delegates elected in 2017. And the establishment didn't see it coming. And they did, <clears throat> they did see it coming and they prepared for it in 2019. And we re reversed a lot of the gains. But one of the things that I had said, um, even before this assembly district delegate process was that um, they should, because I got this from my first show actually was with Stacy Patel, who I was hoping could come on the show. She's the chairman of the uh, Brevard County, Florida Democratic Party. And what they did, they took over their party after Bernie. And the first thing they started doing was hosting town hall meetings in their communities, asking people what the most important issues were to them so that they can represent them within the Democratic Party. And I thought that was such a great idea. I kept urging our California delegates to do that so that they could have the people there to back them up. I'm curious as if, you know, because you were talking about organizing in the way that the Bernie campaign won Nevada, that's also how he, the campaign won California this year. Um, how did you involve the general public in this um, takeover of the state party? So like I said before we do, uh, we've been doing workshop sessions all along. Um, we advocate on issues and policies, but we also do a lot of community engagement. So we do community service projects, we've done mutual aid projects. So we're out there in the community um, engaging all the time. But here in Nevada, the public, general public does not vote for state party um, officers or in that election. So it's a little bit different structure in every state. Uh, the main reason to involve the, involve the public and make sure that they know what's going on and what we're doing here is we want support from the community because it's now going to be our responsibility to turn out the vote. So we obviously are still engaging with the community and making sure that we're constantly on the ground doing that, not just paying lip service when it's time to ramp up for an election. Um, so that's why you have to keep engaging in your communities, make sure that they're part of the process, that you really listen and you understand what the issues are that are important to people, because you have to give them a reason to vote is what it, what it boils down to is people want a reason to vote. They want to know that their elected officials are there to represent their needs, but you have to understand what those needs are. And what we're doing now is leveling the playing field so that um, progressive candidates or candidates that align with the values and principles of the people have an actual chance uh, to win in an election. So that's what we're involved in. And like I said, we're involved on a daily basis in the community and we will continue to do you know, our workshop sessions and continue to do things like town halls, um, give people the opportunity to ask us questions, engage with us you know, on a regular basis, whether it's in person or on Zoom. Right. Now, Sonia, uh, we've got some guests waiting who are involved in uh, their Democratic parties that I wanna bring in to ask some questions of the panel. But first I'd like you to talk a little bit about the Alex Moore situation because I did have Al, uh, Ryan Grimm on my show and he was the one who exposed how uh, 
your state party um, kind of uh, smeared him unfairly and that motivated a lot of people. Tell us what has happened without necessarily um, describing the entire saga. Tell us what's happened since then. Okay. Um, yeah, so the super edited version of the saga is uh, two college Dems decided to concoct a totally fabricated story more than a year before the primary because one of them wanted a job with Richie Neal. So they concocted this homophobic smear against Alex Morse that came out conveniently three weeks before the primary here between Morse and Neal in my district's uh, primary for, for the congressional race. Um, what then ensued was the involvement of Mass Dems leadership uh, because these, these college kids approached them to sort of say, gee, what do we do? We have this letter we wanna to write to this candidate running against your establishment guy. Um, and gee, we don't, need to, we don't know what to do with it. So they, they basically, um, yeah, helped him, which, which we'll get back to that in a second, um, by uh, forwarding him or, or connecting them with the party lawyer, Jim Roosevelt, who uh, apparently helped them edit a letter, maybe suggested it would be more effective publicly, allegedly. Uh, but in any event, um, this whole thing blew up and uh, like magic, became a worldwide story overnight. And uh, so what subsequently happened is this, again, thank you, The Intercept and Ryan Grimm and others who actually revealed the step-by-step -step process of how uh, completely bogus this whole thing was. Um, but after the primary, it, it came out that our, our leadership had been super involved. And uh, yes, it angered a great deal of uh, Massachusetts Dems, particularly, progressive people who had supported Morse, but all the Dems, a, a lot of Dems, not even just those people, I will say, were really upset at the blatant, uh, just <laughs> transparent corruption in interfering with this primary. Um, I was also very upset and uh, having learned about PDPR, I called Larry. Uh, Larry just loves when I call because it's usually yeah, a series of phone calls about something that I'm very upset about. But I called Larry and I said, look, we're really upset about this. And clearly the party's not going to do anything about this. Um, they supposedly hired an independent investigator who was also a party insider to look into the matter. But I said, what can we do in the, in the meantime? What can we as just individuals here and as a part of this party do? Larry looked at the bylaws, uh, and this is something I've learned from him, is almost any organization you're in usually have bylaws of some kind. So he looked at the bylaws and he said, well, there, there are two options here of things you can do. One, you can have, I don't know, it's like 23 members of your uh, state committee actually call for a special meeting and you know, basically to discuss just having this, uh, the chair in this case uh, removed. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find enough people on the Democratic State Committee willing to, to do that. And, um, and in their defense, some of them just said, well, it's not gonna pass anyway. We have about 435 members here in our Democratic State Committee. About a hundred of them are newer people, are, are more kind of open people. But the other 300, what they do in Massachusetts is once you've been a member of the Democratic State Committee for 20 years, they make you a lifetime member which is sort of like the Massachusetts version of a super delegate. So when there is something like this that comes up, like for instance, Bickford's reelection uh, meeting, uh, they just drug all of these you know, fossils, these dinosaurs out onto Zoom, um, offered them all their own tech help so that they could be on Zoom to vote to keep him in. So uh, that's what happened um, on our front. Uh, the other option was you can file just an individual uh, in Massachusetts, Democrat can file a complaint. So that's what happened is, is with Larry's help, we wrote uh, complaints against five people, the, the two college Dems sort of, you know, as a little slap in the wrist, but then the other uh, leadership members that were involved, we wrote complaints asking for basically um, I think it was censure or removal, uh, and over 500 people uh, in just a few days, we had over 500 people sign those complaints. Uh, meanwhile, separately, people, uh, over 100 people on state and town committees had also started, written their own letter that they circulated to say that they supported uh, the first group that came up 
came out after the uh against the leadership's role were the stonewall uh Dems. So basically you had like over a hundred people on your own committees and then these other 500 people, Democrats, all writing to say, we have issues with this. We want these matters addressed. And Chair Bickford didn't even uh, acknowledge, uh, he acknowledged receipt, but he never responded. Uh, in the end, when the investigation ended, the investigator, to her credit, Cheryl Jakes, actually did find that Bickford had violated uh, the party bylaws in, by interfering in a primary. Um, and he never released those findings publicly. Uh, in terms of our complaints, he had someone else look at them and throw them out as being frivolous. So that's, that's kind of what happened with that. Now, at, the, at our local level here, our county level, we actually, uh, this has not died, just so you know, a lot of Democrats here in the state will not let this die, nor should we. Um, and we actually just at our co county level, had a vote to uh, basically say, yeah, we want to, we're continuing to try to get Bickford to uh, either uh, acknowledge these letters that were sent to him and these complaints that were filed or uh, send out apologies to uh, members of this party, et cetera. To date, he's done nothing. He's taken no action. Um, so th that's where that is currently. And well, uh, I, I will just say it will not die. We will right. not let it die. Well, you guys, you, I'm sure you will soldier on. Uh, now, before we get to our questioners, I want to give Selena Vickers an opportunity to talk about what she's doing there in West Virginia, because all eyes are on the state of West Virginia because you have President Manchin living there. President Manchin? Oh my God. Um, President Manchin, because he's really deciding what's the agenda of the Democratic Party. And um, I'm hoping that President Sanders will have more weight with his friend, Joe Biden, than President Manchin will, and all eyes are on this uh, reconciliation bill. I'm really looking, you know, we there's a lot of people talking about Medicare for all and forcing the vote. Forget Medicare for all, my God, we've got to fight a plan to privatize the little Medicare that we have. I don't know if people know that, but there's a policy from the Trump administration that the Biden administration hasn't gotten rid of yet. So I'm gonna be doing a show on that with Diane Archer. She just made a presentation Yay on our North Carolina Medicare for All Coalition meeting. And we have to talk about that. But in the meanwhile, Bernie is focused like a laser beam on trying to you know, lower the eligibility age to 60, uh, get vision, men, uh, dental and hearing aids, and also allow Big Pharma to negotiate with, um, uh, a Medicare to negotiate with Big Pharma. So it sounds like it's sort of small incremental reforms, but right now, if we could get that, it would be huge. And I feel like a lot of people on the left don't understand uh, this inside game. You know, they figure since we can't get everything, we might as well just give up and call everybody a bunch of frauds and sellouts. And I have a real problem with that, but um, I digress. Selena, talk a little bit about what you guys are doing in West Virginia. And does any of it have to do with getting this mansion out? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I mean, yes and no. I mean, it's it's about having a putting together a fair system so everybody has has a fair opportunity to run for senate, um, and that it's not just um, you know the Democratic Party in West Virginia is um, you know uh, completely uh, blindly following Mansion regardless of what he does. Um, you know, we really need to have um, you know. Some, I don't, I hate to sound like a Republican, but we need some competition, uh, we need some fair competition. And um, so it's not, you know, um, specifically about Manchin, but it's about the process that put Manchin in place. And I'd just like to say the, the you know, the summit that, um, that PDR is put, putting on in uh, a couple of weeks, some of the things that we're doing and as some of the things that, um, you know, Judith and Sonia talked about are like, things like that whole th the whole story that Sonia was talking about. I mean, there that those are anti-democratic tactics that the Democratic Party does to stay in control. And there's like a whole session on that. Um, there's a whole section about dissecting bylaws. So really what we want to do is to just kind of tell stories about people who are interested in changing the Democratic Party. I mean, when I came out of the 2016 convention, I wanted to change the Democratic Party. Well, it doesn't matter how much you want to change the Democratic Party. It doesn't matter how pissed you are. It doesn't matter how horrible they are. 
it doesn't matter if you don't do anything about it. And I have been a, you know, big supporter of Dem Inner because the reason the Democratic Party is in such a crappy position and the reason the Republican Party is in such a crappy position is people paid attention to the bylaws. They paid attention to the structure. They paid attention to, you know, how to take over the party, how to get in control. And so the bad people learned how to do it way before the good people learned how to do it. And so we're just doing what they did, you know, years ago. And, and what we find is that we run into bylaws that have been rigged against having new people be involved. Um, so for instance, in West Virginia, um, you know, I just started, you know, going to Democratic Party meetings, figuring, well, I, let me let me go and let me figure out what's going on and maybe I can get involved and maybe I can work my way myself up to leadership. And, you know, people would say, you know, just just work real hard, Selena. And, you know, pretty soon, you know, they'll, if you just hang around, they'll give you they'll give you a responsibility, you know. And what I found is that well, that'd be true if I didn't have an opinion about anything or if I was willing to sit around and, and let crappy things go on. But I wasn't willing to do that. And so I started reading the bylaws and I would go to meetings and I would, I would carry my bylaws around with me and they would do stuff that were completely against the bylaws. And I would go, hey, you know, this isn't, you know, like it says right here, you know, this is, this is what you're supposed to do this. And, you know, I don't mean to upset, but I just thought you'd want to know, well, thank you so much, Selena, for letting us know that we're going to get right on that. We really appreciate you. The next thing. The next time around, they would do the exact same thing. And it didn't take me very long. Well, actually, probably took me a little bit too long to realize that, that like, it was all rigged. They knew exactly what they were doing. They played stupid, but they weren't stupid. They were quite smart. They were quite strategic about trying to keep people out of, of main positions of control. And so then I learned how to write a challenge. And when I learned how to write a challenge, uh, I started getting results. And what I have written a total now of nine challenges and I have not won one, but I have won like me and other grassroots reformers have won like 22 different things in behavior, in, in rules, because when people start paying attention, when you start being public about, and I, actually we haven't even been super public about it. We've just, you know, pushed and pushed against the DNC, pushed against uh, West Virginia. And like, for instance, when I first started, there were nine, uh, nine more men than women on our governing state governing board. They're supposed to be, it's a, it's a, foundation rule, equal division between men and women. None were men and women, men and women, and almost every one of them in a leadership position. And so we filed a grievance about it. Well, all of a sudden, <laughs> we didn't win that. We didn't win that challenge. But all of a sudden, they started changing and started adding women, and then men would leave, and they would add a few more women. And then they did that incorrectly. Like, they would just put people on without giving proper notice. So we'd file a challenge about that. And so, um, you know, it wasn't the path I wanted to take, but by golly, it has um, really led to some major changes. And now uh, because of that, we have new bylaws, we have uh, 14 day notice to, of meetings, we got 30 day notice to elections, um, we have equal division between men and women. When we started, there was not one black person on the executive committee, not one Asian person on the executive committee. Now we have those. So um, just being aware of the rules, and holding the party accountable has made a difference. And we're in the infancy stages of this, uh, but we plan to uh, keep going until we have what we think is um, a fair system and that everybody can participate in. To me, it's not a progressive issue, it's a fair issue. Well, um, I wanna thank you all for sharing this. And I wanna let you know that I've just brought in two um, people who I know are very active in their state parties. And I'd like to give them an opportunity to either make a comment or ask a question about what they've heard so far. Uh, Lauren Nidell has been on my show before. She's active in the uh, Rhode Island Democratic Party and fighting the establishment. And Tim Butler is there in Pennsylvania. So uh, Lauren, would you like to go first? Yeah, I mean, the 
thing that I'm finding right now with the Rhode Island Democratic Party is they are still doing everything they possibly can to pretend that they wanted to be an inclusive party um, while keeping progressives off the, um, off the chain of command, so to speak. We have a very unique party in the sense that this year we have not had a meeting. There's been no regional meetings. There's been zero communication between the party head and um, the state committee members. I'm on the state committee member. And all I've heard is after I sent a kind of a nasty email that there's going to be a meeting on October 14th. Um, I'm not sure if other people find this to be the case, but our, our um, state committee basically does not allow any kind of, um, there, there's no dissent allowed. You can't, you can't ask for a meeting. You can't put things on the agenda. You have to go strictly by their agenda, which is as minimal as it can be. And we have about 10% um, progressives on the committee of about 270 people. And so, so are you um, asking, based on hearing this story, I'd like to know Larry, who's your, the master of rules and procedures, uh, what would be your first piece of advice hearing this story? Well, you know, it, it, it goes back to the age old problem. If you don't have the votes to get things corrected, you're kind of screwed out of getting out of the starting gate. But in, you know, what I would want to do is take a look at the bylaws and see um, what it says about who can call a meeting, uh, see how they have structured this that allows them to think that they cannot allow things to be added to the agenda. I mean, if, if they do not have a set agenda, uh, the parliamentary authority says there will be a item called new business and any member has the right to bring up anything they want and to make a legitimate motion. And so uh, what, what she's describing are fundamental violations of the principles of democracy. And you know what's very interesting? They, did, they redid the bylaws um, two years ago before the pandemic. I requested to be on the bylaws. I'm on the state committee. They did not have one single progressive Bernie cat, Bernie Krat on the bylaws committee to even object or to even put in changes to the bylaws. They totally kept us off. Even though I know personally seven progressives that wanted to be on the bylaws committee and none of them were on it. Judith, what, what are you thinking? Well, I was just going to say that, um, have you read your bylaws? Are you real familiar oh, yeah. with them? Oh yeah. So you know that they, they're abiding by their own bylaws. It's just that the bylaws are written to obstruct any progressive participation. That's what we were finding as well. Um, in Clark County, for instance, they haven't passed a single amendment to their bylaws since 2016. And in 2016, the chair at the time decided to make sure that they obstructed progressives from getting on to the central committees. And so they wrote their bylaws specifically to obstruct progressives and to obstruct um, their membership from making endorsements of progressives too. So they did it in a lot of different ways. And it's been a constant battle to try to amend our bylaws. Now we're in a position where we have a majority so we can start making changes to those bylaws um, but it's going you're going to have to have enough votes to do that in other words and that's one of the things that Larry was referring to um, but it sounds to me like they're also not following parliamentary procedure um, so I found it very helpful myself to take the PDPR workshops and to take the sessions on parliamentary procedure to start figuring out ways to be strategic about using the bylaws in place and there are ways to do that because we found over and over again that what the establishment had done is they had weaponized the bylaws against progressives. Exactly. Um, so we had to find ways to use the existing bylaws um, to remove that obstruction. And so that's when I when we talk about making progressive change or making progressive movement a forward movement in the party, it's about removing that obstruction. You have to start by removing the obstruction before any change is possible. So I would you know, really highly recommend that you attend the summit, that you start to take some parliamentary workshops with, with PDPR and start to learn how you can find ways to use the bylaws that are in place 
um, and turn the tables basically um, so that you can start calling for things from the floor so that you can start raising objections um, so that you can start building power because progressives have to start realizing that we do have power. We have to learn how to use it. Right. Now, Tim, you're the youngest person on this panel here, and you were very inspired by Bernie Sanders to get involved. And I've been watching your posts over the last couple of years, watching you get very disillusioned with your attempts to get involved. Can you talk a little bit about your experience and maybe ask any questions that you might have of the panel? So I'm originally from Portland, Oregon, and I decided, you know, what am I doing with my life? So when people are upset about politics in general, nonetheless, Washington, D.C., or the corruption in Philadelphia across the board. So I got involved about 2013 uh, here in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and seeing even before Bernie, and I thought Bernie was going to be, obviously, he inspired 14 million people to join the Democratic Party. So you can't ignore that, but yet I felt the last two times that Bernie ran, they uh, neutered him, I mean, and, and suppressed him. Um, so I, I've been elected on the local county level. And uh, speaking of bylaws earlier, we have a bylaw in our county committee that a minimum of 100 people, have, committee members, have to be in the room at the same time to vote on anything. Yep. And uh, when 92 people show up on a Saturday, I'm thinking in the last eight years, this is the biggest turnout I've ever seen. And the county chair says we can't vote on anything. And I'm just like, wait a minute, you, we need more people that especially agree with us on an issue to bring up that issue to a vote. This makes no sense to me whatsoever. So I hope your bylaws are not like that way. Um, I hope that there's a roadmap. I mean, our, our state is super corrupt. I just like, I hope Nevada can have a blueprint that other states can use if you're going to take over the Democratic Party. But um, like for me, John F. Kennedy is the reason why I joined the Democratic Party, but he's also kind of the reason why I left. And it's like, I don't see the Democrats being Democratic or using democracy at all, but I know there's so many good people in the party still that are, um, feel, I feel like it's like being a victim in an abusive relationship. As still being a Democrat. I mean, it, it, I mean, that's my take on it. So anybody have any response? And I've been a delegate for Bernie twice. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I, I feel your pain. I understand. I'm, I'm a lifelong Democrat. I've never done exited. I've always voted Democrat. Um, but I also understand why people get so frustrated because I get frustrated all the time. I get frustrated that Democrats seem willing to compromise before we even start talking to each, you know, to the other side. It's like, you know, we're willing to give up everything before we even, we, even when we're in a position of strength. Um, I get frustrated when I feel like, you know, our representatives aren't really representing us or listening to what, what we're saying or, or that they actually care about policies and issues. Um, but I also realize that um, right now, a third party isn't viable because of the way our system is structured. Um, it, it really is a two-party system. And, and unfortunately, that means that so many people are now registering nonpartisan that those nonpartisan numbers will soon be bigger than both party numbers put together. Um, that's the reality of the situation, but there's still this narrative out there that all those nonpartisans, they're nonpartisan because the Democrats are too extreme and the Republicans are too extreme. Um, they're not taking into account the fact that they don't like party politics because they don't feel that they're being represented or that their voices are being heard. Um, that it's not just a whole bunch of moderates or centrists sitting out there saying, well, when they decide to be moderate again, I'll, I'll vote, you know, or I'll vote Democrat or I'll vote Republican. Um, and there's still that narrative that it's only, you know, that this whole country is, is mostly a majority of moderates. That's also not true. We know based just on Bernie's numbers that the majority of Americans actually believe in those policies and issues that used to be called radical, but still seem to be out of our reach because of party politics. So I get your frustration, but I also say that we have to start realizing that we do have strength and power. The more that we work together, the more that we're willing to fight together. And it's not just about changing or fixing the party. It's about removing the obstruction. The obstruction stands in our way of having those policies and issues for the people. So that's why 
PDPR, that's where PDPR comes into play is because it's about democracy and it's about getting back to the roots and principles of democracy, um, making sure that we are working for the people and representing the people and making sure that they have a voice in the system and in the party. Oh, I, I agree. I just don't think how Bernie can run twice and be cheated both times, be neutered, and yet I'm still be supposed to be a part of that organization and still no. endorse Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden. Are you like kidding me? And all the baggage that fuels the other 67-ish percent of the country that's not hardcore Democrats. Yeah, okay. unfortunately, though, there's not very many states that have open primaries. So if you yeah. want to have say in who your elected officials are going to be, you're going to have to register with the party. Um, right. And for me, that's an easy choice if I'm only given a choice of Republican versus And, and those re requirements sometimes yeah. are, I mean, those requirements can be ridiculous for signatures and just to even get on the ballot. I mean, we had a Supreme Court uh, case last year about the old president being on the presidential ballot. I mean, and, and can they really say they're following democracy when trying to kick people off the ballot who made all the requirement, signature requirements to get on the ballot and did all the paperwork and what the Department of State required, so. Well, I don't think the discussion is whether we have a democracy or not. All you have to do is read the Princeton report and we don't have a democracy. We have an oligarchy and right. Uh, right. our government and uh, economy are controlled by the wealthy and Bernie understands that. So to talk about ideals, I think is, you know, they're laughing all the way to the bank where we're talking about ideals. I think the importance of this show is we're talking about process and procedure and how we can beat them at their own game. And Sonia, I know you had your hand up. You want to say something here? Yeah, I, I, because I totally share Tim's frustration. Totally, man. I got thrown in jail in Philadelphia, man. It was so hard for me to stick with this party. I was sweating balls all week and thrown in the back of a paddy wagon with a bunch of other women locked in there for a long time with no AC till they even processed us. No, I, it was very difficult for me to come back to this party, but um, two things. One, in addition to removing obstacles, like Judith talked about, you also, uh, you need to infiltrate. I mean, I consider myself an insurgent in this party and infiltration one of the things i learned again pdpr taught me looking at bylaws and everything i actually learned there's this really weird list of all these people that are able to join our democratic state committee i mean strange like people who speak french there are spaces for a cape viridian there are space. I mean, Larry and I looked at this list and I went, what the, because clearly somebody made this list with certain people in mind. But the thing is, those spaces are not all full. Here in Berkshire County, half of our little towns don't even have people that are, they don't even have a committee at all. So I know it's frustrating and it's hard to get people to dem enter, but there are spaces where we can fill people and get them on the state committee. And I mean, I'm sitting here right now going, okay, we got like a hundred progressives. We need like another, just a little more than a hundred more. So I'm looking for spaces and I'm looking to recruit people and fill those spaces in. And by the way, that the only reason I can ever give people to really get in here and fight because it's as frustrating as it is, is to know this one thing. They hate you being there. They oh, want okay. you oh, yeah. to dumb exit. They, <laughs> they want you to dumb exit. If nothing and, else, and if you run for office, and if you run for office, they will try to do everything to make sure you don't win. Even yeah, if but, they shut everybody else off, even if they don't make history, they will keep the one. We have a faux Democrat here in our county. Everybody, everybody in his campaign is Republican, but he will smear the other Democrats and and push his team aside. So it's like uh, a controlled opposition on that front. Yeah, well, this is what they're doing to Nina Turner right now. And by the way, early voting is starting in Ohio District 11. Please, if you haven't supported Nina, do so. Um, got to get that plug in. But anyway, no, just cling to that. Cling to that, Tim. Just know they hate you being there. They'd love for you to be gone. But you are the youngest person here, and you're going to outlive them. Absolutely. And I also kind of feel that like AOC as an example was like the poster child for my generation. You know, young, immigrant, female from like the Bronx, you know, being a, ba a bartender and then calling AOC mama bear within a couple of years. Like I just, and, and closing up to that, like, and I, I just well, feel like it, it just, what, like, where is the, where's the pressure, pressure being put on them? Okay. Yeah. Listen, I, you know, 
you have to understand that when you're an activist, you cannot behave inside the play the inside game the same way as the activist game. You have to be a lot more stealthy. And I don't have any problem with her calling her mama bear because that's not, um, you know, substantive. And I was saying to Jen Perlman, who I had Perlman, who I had lunch with today, who took on Debbie Wasserman Schultz, we were talking about this. And she made the excellent point. Um, how can you call her a sellout when she still doesn't take corporate money? That's what a sellout is. And she hasn't voted against anything in our progressive agenda. She is, play, she is playing politics with a small P, um, figuring out what she needs to do. You cannot alienate. You have to look. Bernie was in there for 30 years, basically speaking to an empty chamber on C-SPAN. Yeah, I agree. Yep. He was on the outs. It's only now that he's on the ins and he's actually doing all that he can. And you'll notice what he's done. As I said earlier, he's come off of Medicare for all because he knows that's politically impossible. So he is trying to get lower the age of, of Medicare to 60 uh, and also get these other things included. I have something to say to both Kim and Warren. I don't know the exact wording of your local bylaws or your state bylaws, um, but keep in mind that they cannot be out of line with the, with the national charter. And the, the national charter and bylaws, I mean, it's not perfect, but for the most part, it's really, really good. And what we found is that the West Virginia bylaws had stuff in it that did not mesh at all with the national bylaws. And that gave us opportunity to write the challenges and then we were able to negotiate some things and so and there's also this policy statement called the six basic elements of the democratic party which is not in there but it's a, it's a policy statement and it came out of, of of the 60s the civil rights movement and so there may be some things there that you could look at and i mean you know like i found that west virginia um, they had some things in there that were open and then right after the 2016 convention which is the burning uh, state convention uh, uh, literally two months after that they struck out some of those of the six basic elements uh, that would they were opening up the party so um just kind of keep that in mind and that may give you um the, the foothold to uh, to write a challenge and then push for changes the other thing that i just want to say um well two things live go to your meetings and live stream them um, record the meetings, because if you do file a challenge, you need that. And the charter, uh, the national charter, article nine, section 12 says that all meetings at all levels, state, local, national, uh, are public, are open to the public. So if anybody tells you that you cannot uh, li live stream it or record it, um, they're wrong and just stand your ground on that. The last thing is there's no third party. Um, there's there's like the hundred and third party or the hundred or the two hundred and third party like it it is not a new idea it just under like, like Judith said under the circumstances that we have it's it we cannot make that happen until we get at least one of the two parties in, into some kind of semblance of of uh, integrity and justice um, there's no third party that's going to happen there's no it's not going to happen so. It's fine to be outside and pushing, but if you really want to make a difference in, in reforming these parties, you have to do from the inside. And it's not fun at all, but it's 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 important. It's, it's like flossing your teeth. It's you know, nobody wants to do it, <laughs> but you got to do it. You got to do it every day, or you're going to have messed up teeth. So do it. All just, right. Can, just that, Lauren, can I just say one thing? Um, with this, this is with the bylaws committee, which I was not allowed to be on the committee. They also refused to allow me to be at the committee meeting and even hear what was going Relation. on during the meetings. It's and I requested it and they refused to allow me and I'm on the state committee. When did that happen, Lauren? That happened in um, 2018. Okay. Well, that it, you, had, you probably had, had so many days to file a challenge. That was a complete violation. Every Democrat has a right to full participation in all party affairs, <laughs> including when rules are formulated. That's in the DNC bylaws, uh, Article 2, Section 11. That's a great, a great portion to read, Article 2, Section 11. It has a lot of your rights, and that's a complete violation of your rights. 
<laughs> you're going to have more of this advice at the summit. So if your appetite is whetted by what you learned here tonight, Larry, tell us how people can get involved with this summit. First of all, is there a cost? No, there's no cost. Uh, so this is free for anyone to um, attend. And we've tried to make it as simple as possible. So you just go to our website and there's a web page where you can sign up and we will get you the information you need for attending and including the schedule uh, of the events. So the summit is occurring on uh, July 24th and 25th. We're calling it the Summit for Democracy, similar to what Biden is doing with the rest of the world. Uh, we believe that we need democracy here in the United States as well. Uh, and you can go to that website and sign up and uh, register for the event and we will get you uh, enrolled in it. We also have a web page for the classes which uh, have been mentioned in this and uh, that's also open to anybody. So we have a series of classes that we teach on parliamentary process from everything from uh, how to understand bylaws to how to be a presiding officer. And it's actually the only class on how to be a presiding officer that I'm aware of that is taught anywhere. Great. Well, thank you very much for joining me on the show. And like I say at the end of every single show, what we have to do is keep fighting. <laughs>